It seems like Carolina's roster is set for this upcoming season. Or is it? You always need more shooting, particularly on the wing, and apparently there's some shooting down under. You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Thursday, July 20th, 2023. Welcome into the Locked on Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and I want to thank you for joining us on this show to get your first listen or watch of the day. Coming up on the show today, we're going to talk about two football commits that we talked about earlier in the week, Jordan Ship and Malcolm Ziegler. We had already talked about what their commitments mean to the Tar Heels. Today, I'm joined by Brian Smith, Locked On's football recruiting insider, to talk to us about their games and what they will bring to the Tar Heels. Before we get there, though, kind of something that has jumped up and caught me and probably a lot of you by surprise, you might not have even seen this yet, is some recent potential movement in terms of basketball. As you well know from what we've talked about here on the show, or maybe you've seen my rainbow scholarship chart on Twitter, Carolina still has two scholarships left for this upcoming basketball season. The assumption for a while now has been that Carolina's holding Pat, staying Pat, holding Pat, what do you say? I don't know. Anyway, and is not going to utilize those, but will give those maybe to walk-ons or just not use them, something of that nature. But... Some recent developments out of some of the summer action is that there is a guy from Australia who is a 6'8 wing. Sound familiar? What up, Cam Johnson size? You tracking with me? That um, is currently in the class of 2024, but might be interested in reclassifying to 2023 and could come immediately. And his name is Johnny Furphy. So let me just give you some background on him and then we'll talk more about it. He is a 6'8 small forward out of Australia. When I said down under in the cold open, I I thought about pretending to have a a Aussie accent, but y'all, I am terrible at any accent ever. And so for your sake and for mine, I am not attempting that. So bear with me there. (laughs) Furphy is 18 years old. Interestingly, He was initially in the class of 2023, which is this year's freshman, because things hadn't been picking up or moving for him, reclassed back to the class of 2024. But here's what happened. Recently, uh, the NBA each summer has the NBA Academy Games. So the NBA has these academies all over the world. Each summer, they come together in Atlanta for the NBA Academy Games, and they all play each other. Uh, This year, it was July 7th through 9th, so just about, you know, a week and a half ago or so. Um, Each year, there are players that typically break out and then either move up NBA draft boards or come on to college coaches radar. Some recent names that I'll just mention you'll know, Josh Giddy, Ben Matherin, who played at Arizona, or Santiago Vescovi, who's still at Tennessee right now, are some of the guys that have like broken out or popped off at these academy games. Now, obviously, college coaches are allowed to attend this event and saw Johnny Furphy just absolutely break out. Uh, apparently, from, from the things I've read and, and looked up on him, he's somebody that has had a skill set for a while, but his body and size are catching up. And so a lot of these guys will just wait, stay in Australia, and then go straight to the pros. But Furphy told Travis Branham of 247 Sports, quote, it's always been a big dream of mine to earn a scholarship and seeing Australian players do it, it's been a big goal of mine, end quote. So this kid wants to come to America and play college basketball. And y'all, let me tell you, I love, love what I see from him. Um, so it, you know, I, I talked about his classifying back and forth. He's still in the class of 24 right now, but per Eric Bossy, also of 247 Sports, um, in an article he wrote, he said, quote, to make things more interesting, it is sounding more and more like Furphy will actually make his way to the States as a member of the class of 2023, which would obviously be like this summer he'd have to come. Here's the thing. I would love to have him at Carolina. I I just talked about it, but 
you know, since Cam Johnson, I don't think Carolina, not I think, Carolina hasn't had a shooter of that size and caliber and quality since Cam at that position. All due respect to Leakey and others that have been there. Uh, it's just, I mean, obviously you see it the way Cam is blowing up now in the NBA. And so Furphy has that size. He's got rec- all, all sorts of stuff. I'm going to talk about his game in just a minute. But the thing is, obviously, because he's blowing up, it's not just Carolina that's seeing him. All these big name schools, a bunch have already offered. But um, from what was chronicled at, at this, Duke is there watching him, Gonzaga, Kansas, UCLA, etc. Kansas has already offered him something you might be aware of. If you, if you haven't, let me fill you in. Kansas just lost Marcus Adams Jr., who was a freshman, supposed to be a freshman this upcoming season at Kansas. He asked out of his national letter of intent, which, by the way, I feel like we've seen more and more of this offseason than ever before um, and is gone. So Kansas, who already probably needed depth, needs it all the more so now, although I feel like they've got some requisite depth at that small forward position. Remember, they got Nick Timberlake, who Carolina was going after this after. Uh, I think he'll probably be their three. Um, So Kansas is already offered. At the point of this recording, Carolina has not offered him, although he's clearly and obviously on the radar. Hubert Davis has seen him. And so it it is something that we need to think about and process. So let me talk to you about why I love the the idea of Johnny Furphy and what I think he could bring to the Tar Heels. Again, I love his positional size at 6'8". That, that's something that Carolina has had at that small forward position for a while, whether it was Cam or Leakey or whomever. That's massive size and a great um, thing in, on your side of the ledger, right? To be able to have a 6-8-3 is a big deal. So first off, the biggest thing is this dude can shoot and, and Carolina needs that. Somebody that at the wing has big size and can get the ball off from deep. Johnny Furphy can do that. But here's the great thing. It ain't just that. He's not somebody, I think I said some this about somebody else recently, not somebody that just, you know, um, hangs out around the perimeter and, and just hunts his shot. Because Furphy is a guy that will get in and rebound, and then he gets out and leads the break. He can in, finish in transition, whether, you know, a spot up three, get into the rim, and de- like he has the ath- a high-level athlete that finishes with authority in the lane. Go check it out. He's also not someone, a lot of times you see these shooters just rely on and depend on shooting. That's not him. He is somebody that will get set up for a shot. You know, it's one that's like, yeah, take that. Pump fake you, past you, dunking all over you at the rim. I love that he doesn't settle for a three-point shot. He has all that athleticism. And then also because of that requisite height, I've seen him on film block a lot of shots, whether it's, you know, switching onto a two or just as as a secondary defender or being the primary defender against his guy, he can cause some problems uh, with opponents getting a shot off over him. So I love to see that. You remember the, the transfer from Northern Colorado um, Dalton connect that I really wanted Carolina to get that ended up at Tennessee Uh, Going back to Tennessee, we talked about Santiago Vescovi. Um, This, I I believe that Furphy could fill the role that I think Connect would have filled with all the athleticism and shooting and stuff that he brought to the table. But here's the thing. Furphy is even bigger than Connect, who's 6'6". Again, Furphy's 6'8". So even more size. I love it. And I think Carolina should go get him. Another quote from Eric Bossy of 247. He says, quote, Furphy was the talk of the NBA Global Academy event thanks to his skill level, shooting, and ability to make plays for himself and others with the ball in his hands. Man, I love all of that. He can shoot. He's a guy like I saw multiple plays of him finding a teammate cutting back door for a layup, whatever it is. He can make plays. He can shoot. I'm all in. Gimme Johnny Furphy. Let's go get him. He's going to be a great addition for whoever lands him. I'm hoping it's UNC. Um, and I would imagine this will go pretty quick. Like if he's going to be, if he's going to be a class of 23 guy, somebody's got to get him on campus pretty quick. So um, I'm imagining we'll see visits set up pretty soon. 
and hopefully Carolina can be in on that. So obviously we'll talk about more as we learn of Furphy's actual plans. Next, we want to talk about Jordan Ship, the wide receiver that committed this past Sunday and what he'll bring to the table for the Tar Heels. Before we get there, though, I need to tell you that this episode of Locked on Tar Heels is brought to you by LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. And that's why you got to check out LinkedIn Jobs, which helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. It's so easy to create a free job post, and then you just add this purple hashtag hiring frame to your profile, and that helps spread the word that you're wanting to hire. And then you can use these simple tools like screening questions that help you filter through everybody to find just the right candidate who's got the skill set and experience that you need to help prioritize who you want to hire and after interviewing them and get the right person. Let's be honest, that right person can be just the thing to have a positive and measurable impact on your business. All of this is why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus the leading competitors. So what do you need to do? Well, you need to go to LinkedIn jobs right now to help find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Once again, that's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. It's great to be joined on Locked on Tar Heels today by Brian Smith, our football recruiting insider here on the Locked on Network. By the way, LinkedIn is the college recruiting sponsor across our network. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Terms and conditions apply. So grateful to have LinkedIn back sponsoring all these recruiting segments. And man, that affords us the opportunity to have Brian here with us. And Brian, let's get right into this because you said on this show last week, I asked you, hey, Tar Heel fans are now starting to see some of these higher level recruits committing to Carolina in the class of 24. And you had said, man, the, the Carolina fans just need to be patient as they wait for top end guys to commit. And now it's starting to roll a little bit for the Tar Heels, starting with over the past weekend, Jordan Ship, who becomes the second wide receiver in the class for North Carolina, but the highest ranked receiver in this Uh, at this point in the game. Now, Brian, earlier this week on our show, I talked about what his commitment means for Carolina. Right now, with you today, I want to talk more about what it is that Jordan Ship brings to the table with his game. First off, he just catches everything. (laughs) I know that sounds very boring, but I was watching his film and didn't matter if it was a piss poor pass or if it was completely on the money, he, he just catches the football. And after he does, he transitions almost to like a running back Hmm. immediately. Yak. You hear that term all the time. It's very boring, but just means yards after catch. He maximizes. And he's a guy that you can put in the slot to do that. You can play him out wide. You can run him out of the backfield. It doesn't matter. He's just a versatile kid. He's a football player. Hmm. I bet he would be a good safety. doesn't really matter. He's a good football player. So I think he'll be used immediately in the slot because that's the easiest to adapt to. You don't get bumped as much. But eventually, he can be your your matrix guy, the guy you do all kinds of stuff with. And I think he's going to be a player that, like, if they keep this style they've had, I know the coordinator changed, but if they still want to go up top a lot, and Lord only knows Carolina does, I would imagine he's going to be a kid that's going to put up some big numbers. Again, he makes special catches. And he also takes a five-yard hitch and turns it into a 40-yard gain. So – I like those kind of guys, and I think Carolina fans will too. <laughs> Man, you got to love that yak ability that he brings to the table. Now, Brian, something interesting that you talked about there that I don't think we hit on too terribly often is his transition from being a receiver to being a runner. Like, if we're talking triathlon or something, we think a lot about transitions from swim to bike or bike to run or whatever it is. But I don't think too often we think about that switch that a receiver has to make. Um, is, is that something how, like, how often are you paying attention to that is what do you do in that transition mode from receiver to runner? And, and as you talked about with him kind of almost looking more like a running back in making that switch, which allows for all that yak, what, what, like, is that high level, uh, for what you see compared to other receivers? His vision is tremendous. Hmm. When you catch the ball and you run a slant, 
any receiver you ask is probably going to lie, but they'll say, I'm not worried about getting hit. They're <laughs> lying. Okay? I, I worry about getting hit and I'm not even <laughs> they're doing it. <laughs> that's why you're sitting here with me, but that's, that's beside the point. If you can still find a way to not only not alligator the, you know, if you've ever heard that term, the alligator. Yep. There was, there's been a lot of guys that are great players that have been like, screw this. I'm living to put, sometimes to be honest, it's better not to go for the ball. Make a business decision. <laughs> you know, I mean, if your star receiver's got a chance to break his ribs on this play, second and 10 is okay. Yeah. Fans may yell, but I, I get it. Anyway, he will find a way to not only get to the point to catch the ball, catches it cleanly away and tucks it so fast, he expedites the process. Hmm. And then he just, I don't, I don't know what it is, how natural, but he finds the correct path to separate between the linebackers and the safeties. It always seems like he's running free. It's hmm. kind of weird because he's not a burner burner, but they don't hit him right away. It's just, he, uh, Jerry Rice was kind of like that. Nobody ever caught Jerry. And people talk about that comparison. I'm, and I'm never comparing anybody to Jerry directly, but he had great vision as much as he was fast. He knew where to run and why. And he, people just left him alone. If he's going to do this, we're good. It's the same kind of thing. Certain guys are like that. Terrell Owens, obviously, again, phenomenal athlete. <laughs> that guy just found a way in space, and he was faster than everybody anyway. When you do those things, even if you're not a burner, you're still going to get an extra four or five yards where other guys get tackled. That's right. I hate seeing receivers catch the ball. They don't make a good decision. They hesitate, and then they get you get five yards between you and the other guy. What are you doing? Get up field. Just go he north. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, and it, how many times you see that ends up being fourth and one and you're just like, really? Because if you're on your side of the field, I mean, that's a lot to ask the coach to go for it, man. Because if it fails, that's that's like a turnover. Right. So you have to maximize in those situations. And I just think his vision from the catch to bring it in to move is incredible. Well, and when you combine that with that catch radius he has that you talked about, Brian, when you have not just the hands, not just the eyes, but not just the legs, but the combination of all of that, man, that's a match made in heaven. What, what's interesting to me is, you know, for Carolina fans thinking about the receiver position and you talked about the slot, obviously with losing Josh Downs and you still got Kobe Pesor hanging out for Carolina, who I imagine will start in the slot this year. I mean, you look at Downs and he is not the 6'2", 195 that Jordan Ship is. What does it do for you to have a guy that is 6'2", coming out of the slot? I mean, you, we laughed about me. I'm Josh Downsize without his speed, but this dude, Jordan Ship, 6'2", 195, slot ability? Come on, man. That's got to be good, right? He could play either one. I, it wouldn't surprise me that the first play he's on the field for Carolina, if he was in the slot or if he was in flanker, if they even put him at running back to run a wheel route, he's a football player. He doesn't really have a position. It's just that slot is so easy compared to the other ones because you're back off the line of scrimmage 90% of the time. They can't bump you. And if you don't get bump on him as quick as he is in short space, good luck. And then his power and his route running kind of takes over. Once he gets a little bit stronger, and he could play boundary. And when you can play all three. Then the other team, like, okay, it's third and four. We know they want to go to Jordan. Where is he going to line up? Right. That's when you're a great player, when it's here and you can handle those kinds of things. And based on how he runs after the catch and everything, I'm going to go out on a limb and guess he's pretty high IQ. He's not your normal kid. No. And and I got it like that. What you're talking about there makes me shift my brain to thinking about this from the from the viewpoint of a D.C. What what does that um, that matrix ability you talked about moving all over the field do to a, a defensive coordinator's schemes and plans trying to match up with this guy? This is a very extremely boring answer, but it's 100% true. They go generic. Hmm. You don't know what the hell they're going to do. Cover three, cover two. Then when we see, we might adjust depending. Like if you put Jordan, I talked to a, a DC last year about this and he, he almost got mad just me asking. And this was an off the record because it's just true. There's nothing they can do about this. Gotcha. You go triangle, you can't play bump at all. 100% advantage to the offense. You put a guy with those kind of skills with the additional advantage of putting him in the triangle in a bunch. Good luck. I mean, there's, I mean, even <laughs> Nick Saban struggles with that. There is no better DB coach on the planet. It's just hard. So if he moves the boundary, you're still in a tough spot. And if you put triangle on the other side, because are you going to put two guys on one to one side of the field? I mean, it, that's why those formations are so unfair almost, but everybody runs them. And it, it mitigates the talent that like Georgia and Bama get because you take the front seven all but out of the play. Because you're not going to just go to beat Georgia, Alabama up front. You're just not. 
you got to throw the ball. That's where guys like Jordan Ship can just manhandle a game. They can have five catches in a drive because you don't know how to match up with him. He moves all over the place. Boy, that is a good problem to have when he is on your team. Also, Brian, I love to see Keenan Jackson, who's the other wide receiver commit in this class, also a Charlotte area kid. They play seven on seven together, was there at Ship's commitment. And you just love to see that camaraderie in place already when they're in high school. And so really excited to see what they can do together in college. Now, I want to go from talking about Jordan Ship to the other four-star commit who committed to Carolina less than 24 hours after Jordan Ship, a guy that if he was on another team might actually be guarding him. That's Malcolm Ziegler, a high-end corner or a secondary player coming in for the Tar Heels. We'll get to talking about his game in just a second. All right, folks, we're joined today by Brian Smith here on Locked on Tar Heels. We just talked about Jordan Ship, a wide receiver commit in the class of 2024 coming to Carolina, another in-state guy. Now we talk about yet another in-state commit for the Tar Heels. And in fact, he is the fifth ranked player in the state of North Carolina in the class of 24. That is always what you want to do. So, uh, Brian, same thing. Earlier this week, I talked about what Ziegler's commitment means to the Tar Heels. Now I want to transition to talking about who he is, what he does, and why it's such a big get for Mac Brown's team. Number one, we've said this before, for Carolina to maximize, that state is loaded. <laughs> it, it is loaded. It's a state that is on the rise, population base, football importance, having the Panthers, all kinds of things are their advantage. But that state is kind of in between because it is a transient state to a certain degree. Kids come in and go and they need to do a better job. Well, here's a great example. They get two in-state kids in, what was it, 24, 36 hours, whatever yeah. it was. That's that's called maximizing. So if you're going to compete with Clemson, if you're going to compete with Florida State, these are the battles that you have to win. In, so that's first thing. Forget the position of the player. They have to win at home. Second, defense is, let's be honest, not – the most friendly topic with Tar Heel fans. They stink <laughs> in the secondary. They stink. And they've got to get better. This is the kind of kid that can do that. Ball skills are very good. He has the speed more of a corner, in my opinion. He's not yeah. just a burner burner, but he can run. And he's got some length. He can play free or strong safety. And I think he can play early. They need help in the secondary. This is the kind of guy that can do it. So I'll be curious to see how quickly he adapts to the college level because physically he's what you're looking for. Yeah, I mean, essentially, you know, we often think about – uh, cornerbacks as as being kind of smaller than the receivers they're going up against. But as I look at the size of the two guys we're talking about today, Ship and yeah. Ziggler, they're essentially the same. Ziggler's 6'2", yeah. 198, whoa, whoa, 6'2", 195 on Ship. So he's got them by three pounds and they're the same height. Like if I can put that size cornerback on a receiver that's got the requisite speed, I mean, according to his coach, his high school coach, he runs a 4'4", which at that size, man, I, I love to hear that. Uh, like putting somebody like that out on the corner uh, to be able to, I mean, that probably gives you the bump ability against a receiver, but also to be able to go up with him to high point a ball. Like it, I, that's got to be helpful for Carolina's defense. I think you got to try him there. Uh, a lot of people think he'll end up at safety, and if he does, yeah. so be it. Yeah. But at worst, he's going to be the star nickel guy if you want to move him around. And again, it's length, man. If you're going to play, especially if you ever have any aspirations to go to the playoff and do something, if you don't have some rangy DBs, you might make it to the playoff, but you might want to turn the TV off really fast too. <laughs> just ask TCU. I mean, it's just, you got to have NFL talent in the secondary. There is no shortcut, bro. There is none. They will light you up. So even think about it this way. Georgia gave up 40 plus to Ohio State. Georgia's defense. <laughs> you don't have DBs, man. It's, it's hard. These quarterbacks and the way these schemes are, it's hard. The way you get around that is speed and length. That's what this kid has. Hmm. And it seems like, at least from the words from his coach, like one of the things his coach talked about is, in my words, he's something of a quarterback on defense, really good at, at knowing schemes, about getting his teammates lined up. And, and Brian, how does being able to combine that with that length and speed you talked about um, help, you know, essentially bring a coach out onto the field? Well, if you don't have guys out there that can help, I mean, he can walk up to somebody and tell them before the snap, hey, you need to move over. Coach can't do that. I mean, it's literally that basic. And sometimes you just got to yell out signals to guys. <laughs> it's just, it's, I know it's really boring to talk about that, but when a guy is one spot, like two inches out of the place, it's the difference between a touchdown and an incomplete pass. So 
those are important factors. And there's also a leadership factor with that. When you trust the guy at the back end, usually you try to put your best athlete at free safety or middle linebacker. It's not any newsflash. If you trust that guy, and you, I would play him at safety the high school. I don't know what all they do for this next season. They might play him some at corner or whatever. Yeah. The teams can't avoid you there. At corner, I can avoid him. I just go to the other side of the field. Other side of the field, right. <laughs> yeah, but if he's that smart, maybe he is just a pure safety at the next level, and he could be your quarterback of the defense because with the RPO game and all the little intricacies, it is no longer fun to play deep secondary like it used to be because no. you've got to help everybody, and that's a lot of work. Run it's a lot of off the field yeah. work that film and studying the playbook and signals. It's it's a lot of stuff. Oof, not a burden I would want to bear. Again, why I'm sitting here talking to you. Um, so Brian, we we just talked about it. you mentioned it off the top of this conversation, but Carolina's defense and secondary in particular has has had its struggles, and I think that's probably putting it nicely. Ziggler now is the sixth secondary commit in this class for the Tar Heels. Just to name off the others, Zion Ferguson, Tyson White, Khalil Conley, Jaden Patterson, and Jalen Thompson, who we talked about last week. Uh, is that, in, in what you typically see in a class, is that an unusually high number of secondary guys, or is that something Carolina is just going to have to do to foster that competition so they can find the guys they need to fill out the secondary and hopefully move to a higher level of defense? Both. <laughs> it's, it's both i mean you've heard the old saying we're going to throw money at it well this is kind of the answer to that and recruit like we don't know which ones are going to stick but by golly we're going to throw a bunch of them up there on the wall to see because we we can't be like this i mean they had grimes and the other i mean they had two guys that were good last year talent wise and they still couldn't stop anybody yeah. i think they were 105th in total defense or something like that I, it was 112th year before i mean they're just terrible Part of it is they just lose. They cannot win 50-50 in close balls. They can't. And then how many games did you watch last year where Carolina didn't have a bust? I mean, just walk in and, you know, that's – they've got to have more guys that are leadership. Again, we talked about that a little bit. Can you find a way to be consistent with that? Because the teams that win usually don't beat themselves. Carolina found a way to beat themselves multiple times last year, especially at the end. I mean, it was just unbelievable. Yeah. That's how you that's how you get over the hump, man. You got to have a few guys that kind of make up for the recruiting overall, maybe as young players, and maybe one of these kids like Zion. I could see him coming in and playing corner right away. He's got that kind of ability. Hmm. But can he handle all the playbook and all that stuff? That's why you take six. Just because you're talented doesn't mean diddly. You got to take on all that stuff. Kind of to translate. Be mature. Yeah. 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 Are you going to class? You staying out of trouble? All that stuff matters. We may not see it. Mac Brown does. And that man, while he seems uh, congenial and happy, he'll get <laughs> after you if you're not doing the right thing. Yes, he can. I've heard uh, some stories. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's no secret that the offense is doing what they need to do, but the defense has to find a way to keep up. And hopefully right. this incoming glut of uh, secondary guys in the class of 24 will help with that. Brian Smith, great stuff as always. Thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely, buddy. Look forward to doing it again. That's it for this episode of Locked on Tar Heels. Again, my thanks to Brian Smith for joining us. Man, he does such a great job letting us know what these football recruits bring to the table and what they mean for the Tar Heels. Well, coming up on tomorrow's show, we'll wrap up our week. You everydayers, make sure you tune in with us. If you're a visitor to the show, thank you so much for being here. Come be an everydayer and join us. You can follow the show on Twitter at Locked on Heels. Follow me at Isaac shade don't forget to email us locked on tar heels at gmail.com you can even submit a video question just your name where you're from in a quick question 15 seconds or less and you might see it wind up on the show don't forget to subscribe smash the like button and leave comments on your thoughts on johnny furphy or either of these football commits friends it's always a great day to be a tar heel i'll be right back with you tomorrow but until then peace <laughs>